ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar, The Dutch Approach to Inland Port Ecosystems, brought to you by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to Malaysia. Thank you to everybody who has logged in early, way on time for this webinar. We have a special treat for you. We will play a short video by the Holland International Distribution Council. And the video is called Holland Knows the Way. Enjoy, and we'll see you again in a few minutes. Thank you. We are Holland. With our 400 years of international trade experience, we know the way to excellent logistics, fast and according to the latest quality standards. With our outstanding hinterland connections by road, river, short sea and rail, the accessibility of our world-class seaport and airport, we know the way to Europe and the world. 24-7, 365 days a year. With our flexible multilingual labor force, we know the way to do business in Europe. With our smooth processes, we offer fast accessibility for your goods to distribute to and from the European market. We achieve continuous improvements in logistics. Our professional training, research and educational institutions empower the rise of well-educated and trained people on a permanent base. Our knowledge, skills and innovations are exported worldwide. Optimize the possibilities of the digital era. We are Holland. We have the expertise, network and knowledge to perfect your operations across all industries. Holland knows the way. Thank you for all the participants who have already logged in to the webinar, The Dutch Approach to Inland Port Ecosystems, brought to you by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to Malaysia. The early birds just got to see the video, Holland Knows the Way. If there's time at the end of this webinar, we will play it for you again. And otherwise, we will provide you with the link in the follow-up email after this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, we will start the webinar in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, please, read our housekeeping rules and look at the other slides that we have for you as an introduction. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for logging into this webinar. We will give it one more minute for some more attendees to log in. We will start shortly. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon in Malaysia. Good morning in the Netherlands. And welcome to the webinar, The Dutch Approach to Inland Port Ecosystems, brought to you by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to Malaysia. We're gonna have a fantastic program for you in the next 90 minutes. So please sit back and enjoy the session. You have already had the chance to uh, see the slides with our speakers, as well as the program, as well as the house rules. 
just some important notes. Please, of course, note that your um, camera as well as your microphone has been off when entering the webinar. And please remain muted throughout the session to avoid any disruptions to the presenters. Please type your question in the Q&A box. And later at the Q&A session, that might also be an opportunity for the moderator to invite you live into the session. So you receive a cue to unmute and engage directly with the moderator and speakers. So we will monitor your questions in the Q&A box. Please don't post your questions in the chat box. Thank you very much. All right, those were the most important housekeeping rules. And now to lead this session, it's my pleasure to invite Ms. Reshma Yusuf, the founder and managing director of the Center for Logistics Leadership in Business, CLLB, to take over and lead you through the session. Reshma, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Marco. Good morning um, for those of you in the Netherlands and good afternoon for us here in Malaysia and peace be upon you. I would like to thank um, the uh, Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands for inviting me today to moderate the webinar. And today's webinar is on the Dutch approach to inland port ecosystems. So it's gonna be a really interesting webinar today, 90 minutes. We'll start with an uh, overview from our side, from the Ministry of Transport, where we'll get a Malaysian inland port landscape. And after that, we have a couple of, uh, of uh, speakers from the Netherlands itself who are gonna give us the insights on how it is done there, so we can learn. Um, just to start with, before um, I invite His Excellency to give his welcoming speech, just to give you a little bit of an insight on what an inland port is for those of you who probably are or would like to know more about it. An inland port is generally a dry port. It is an extension to a sea, sea port and it's usually connected with uh, either road transport or rail links. So we'll be talking about that today. And uh, to begin the session, of course, um, we, uh, I would like to invite His Excellency Mr. Art Jacoby, who is the ambassador of the uh, uh, Embassy of the Kingdom of the uh, of the Kingdom of Netherlands, to give his welcoming speech. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar on the Dutch approach to inland port ecosystems. Just like many other organisations, the Netherlands Embassy is taking its work online these days. Connecting networks in Malaysia and the Netherlands is one of our key objectives. And although we would have preferred this event to take place in real life rather than online, this webinar provides an excellent alternative to connect Malaysian and Dutch networks under the present circumstances. We are pleased with our cooperation with the Ministry of Transport and with all the other key stakeholders from the ports and logistics industry. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Malaysia and the Netherlands have much in common. We are both open trading nations. And just like Malaysia, the Netherlands is a regional hub. In fact, the Netherlands is the regional hub for Europe. And Malaysia has the ambition to further strengthen its regional hub function. And in our discussions with the Ministry of Transport, it became clear that in order to do so successfully, a well-functioning inland port ecosystem will be essential. To support this development, we are keen to share best practices from the Netherlands and explore further avenues of cooperation. The Netherlands is Europe's logistics hub and home to more than 2,000 distribution centers. With excellent transportation linkages and top service providers, we continue to attract foreign-owned logistics and distribution operations. This is only possible because of the extensive network of inland waterways connecting the Netherlands to its hinterlands. These account for nearly 80% of all the vessels that sail inland within Europe. Inland container terminals are well linked by the Dutch rail network to destinations across the European Union. And that again is interlaced with thousands of kilometers of roads and highways. The Netherlands is as such the top location for international road freight transportation. In this webinar today, we will highlight best practices of the Dutch system that has propelled the Netherlands as the gateway to Europe. We present to you an interesting panel of experts from the Ministry of Transport of Malaysia, the Holland International Distribution Council, and the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. 
our panelists will touch on key topics, including the current landscape of inland ports in Malaysia. They will give key insights into the Dutch inland port ecosystem and the multi-modular transportation systems in place. And if this webinar spurs your interest on particulars of the Dutch logistics ecosystem, or you are looking for a good Dutch business partner, rest assured that the Netherlands Embassy is eager to introduce you to innovative Dutch solutions in the maritime and logistics sectors. I would like to thank you for joining us today and I look forward to meeting you in our future real life events. I wish you a fruitful webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. It is interesting to note the support that we are getting from our Netherlands counterparts, yeah, from our Dutch counterparts. I would like now, I would like to now invite um, the Deputy Secretary General of Policy from the Ministry of Transport Malaysia, Ms. Norma Osman, to give us uh, a welcome speech. The mic is now passed to you. Thank you, Rashma. Am I on? His Excellency, Mr. Art Jacobi, Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to Malaysia, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. On behalf of the Ministry of Transport, I would like to welcome all participants to this interesting webinar today. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend our appreciation and thank the Embassy of Netherlands for organizing and making this webinar possible, possible within a short period of time. What is more notable is that the discussions and preparations for this webinar were done virtually, living up to our new normal. We are honored to have in our presence Ambassador Art Jacobi. I welcome his positive outlook on the positioning of Malaysia as a regional hub in the maritime and logistics sector. I wish to also extend my warm welcome to our distinguished Dutch speakers in the Netherlands, namely Ms. Mr. Remco Berman, CEO, Holland International Distribution Council, Dr. Larissa Bendelach, Director, Erasmus Center for Urban Transport uh, and Transport Economics, Erasmus University of Rotterdam, and our moderator, Ms. Reshma Yusuf, Director, Center for Logistics Leadership in Business. I hope that the deliberation today will provide us deeper insights on how the Dutch logistics ecosystem works. Ms. Anis Mardana Abdullah, Deputy Undersecretary from the Logistic and Land Transport Division, Minister of Transport Malaysia, will also present an overview of Indian ports in Malaysia and our future plans to develop this sector. An Indian port, or also known as dry port, is a part of specialized center or location developed to serve the intermodal transportation network. It is connected by, rail, by road or rail to a seaport operating as a center for the transshipment of sea cargo to inland destinations. It becomes fundamental elements of local, national and international transportation systems worldwide. Furthermore, in line with its role, an inland port also includes facilities for storage and consolidation of goods, maintenance for road, or rail cargo carriers and customs clearance services. The location of these facilities at an Indian port relieves supports for storage and customs space at the seaport itself. An Indian port helps to speed up the flow of cargo between ships and major land transportation networks by improving the movement of imports and exports, moving the time-consuming sorting and processing of containers inland away from congested seaports in creating a more central distribution point. In Malaysia, inland ports assume an, an, an essential role in providing access for manufacturers and producers in the hinterland to seaports, which act as gateways to the nation's trade. Inland ports can be identified by the types in terms of distance, such as close, mid-range and distant, apart from location, including seaport-based, city-based and border-based. Border Every type of inland port plays a significant role in the freight transport system as a freight distribution center. 
The first inland port in Malaysia was built at Padang Besar, followed by three others, namely at Ipoh, Nilai and Segamat since the 90s to accelerate container movements to major seaports, including Port Klang, Penang Port and Port of Tanjung Pelepas. There is an inland port in Sarawak called Tebedu Inland Port, which was established in 2004 to facilitate the cross-border trade between Malaysia and Indonesia. Malaysia is also currently developing another inland port in Serendah. I'm sure you will hear from our distinguished Dutch speakers on how the Netherlands becomes Europe's logistics hotspot by developing connected multi-modes of transport systems. As a maritime hub, it is home to Europe's largest port, which is in Rotterdam, and the fifth largest port located in Amsterdam. Dutch seaports are well connected through inland barge networks on the waterways to the hinterlands. High volumes of cargo currently transported from Rotterdam is able to reach most parts of Europe in a short time. As Malaysia moves towards becoming an important distribution hub for this region, there is much that can be emulated from the success of the Netherlands in developing the port and logistics industry. Our large and expanding transshipment hub offers tremendous opportunity for the country in the field of content handling and terminal design so as to increase efficiency and capacity for both the existing and new terminals in a sustainable way. With affordable land available within free commercial zones around the major ports and a fertile investment ecosystem in place, Malaysia has the advantage to be an attractive location to establish a regional distribution center to serve the growing Southeast Asian market and for companies to locate the distribution hubs here. Therefore, in order to capitalize on this opportunity, it is imperative to enhance the connectivity of transportation systems and improve efficiency within the logistics industry. The discussion today could pave a way for further collaborations with the Netherlands through the sharing of best practices to invigorate our maritime and logistics sector. I hope all the participants will learn more from our esteemed speakers, and I also hope that all of you will benefit from this session. With that, I wish you all a fruitful webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Norma. And it's very interesting for us to note the interest that MOT has shown um, in terms of developing our inland ports and moving us up the chain in terms of a regional logistics distribution hub. Uh, for Southeast Asia or for Asia for that matter. I would like now to um, a bring, introduce our next speaker, or I would say our first speaker of the panel. However, before our speaker comes up, um, we have got a little bit of a poll to start the session with. And uh, the poll question should be coming out now. Yeah, hmm. so if you can answer these poll questions, uh, we can then get our next speaker. And yes, the poll questions have been out. So our next, next speaker is Juan Anis Mardiana. Juan Anis Mardiana is the Deputy Undersecretary for the Logistics and Land Transport Division from the Ministry of Transport Malaysia. She's going to give us an overview of the Malaysian inland port landscape. Uh, Juan Anis, uh, can I please pass the mic to you? Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Reshma. Welcome, Juan. So, okay. Uh, his Excellency, Mr. Art Yacobi, Ambassador of Netherlands, Ms. Norma, Deputy Secretary General of MOT, and participants of this webinar. So good day to all of you. Um, I hope everyone is in good health and stay vigilant in our fight against COVID-19. So as um, introduced by our moderator, my name is Anis Madiana, currently serving as Deputy Undersecretary in charge of Logistics Section in Ministry of Transport Malaysia. I will share with, sorry, yes. Apologies, uh, due to a technical glitch, we're going to do the poll again, please. Okay, 
Yes. Yeah, right now the poll is coming up with the answer uh, options. Okay. Apologies for that, but please continue in the meantime as well with your presentation. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So basically, I will share with you today the brief overview of uh, Malaysia inland port landscape. So my presentation today will be divided into three parts. The first, I will share with you the background of Malaysia inland port in terms of the location and its features. And then the institutional framework in terms of the governance of inland port in Malaysia. And finally, I will also highlight some challenges and way forward with regards to inland port in Malaysia. So as a background, uh, some of it has been shared by uh, Ms. Norma before in terms of the purpose of the development of inland port. And as highlighted before, in terms of Malaysia's geography, more than three quarters of Malaysia's total land is open to maritime water. As such, uh, maritime industry has been extremely important since the 1970s and it has become an set important sector that supports our economic growth. Okay, uh, let me. Uh, in, in Malaysia, the importance of a uh, Malaysian port can be summarized into two. The first one is to depressurize the increasing container volume at major seaport, such as Port Klang and PTP. And the second is to provide link between the neighbor country, for example, the Sarawak and Kalimantan, uh, Kalimantan Indonesia for our Borneo part. Okay, currently in Malaysia, uh, we have, maybe we should have the answer for the pool question first to go into this. But anyway, uh, in Malaysia currently, we have five inland port. Okay, most of you get the answer right. 67% of you get this answer right. Yes, we have five inland port in Malaysia. Uh, four is located in the East Malaysia, which is Padang Besar, Ipoh, Nila and Segamat, and one is in West Malaysia, which is in uh, Tebedu, Sarawak. Okay, basically, sorry. Okay, basically, these are the locations of our inland port. As you can see, we are surrounded by sea and Malaysia has a very uh, good road connectivity to the seaport. And these uh, two factors does not really uh, promote inland port activities in Malaysia. As you can see here, this is the location of our inland port, the one in red. And this is all our seaport. And this is only the federal port. We also have a state port, for example, in Sabah here, we also have Kota Kinabalu ports and also uh, Sepanga port. Okay. Moving on to the features of Malaysia inland port. As you can see in Padang Besar, basically it's to facilitate the cross-border container cargo between Malaysia and Thailand. And the focus is more on the uh, mode of rail transport. For Ipoh Cargo Terminal, uh, it is to facilitate the trade uh, activities in the Kinta Valley, which is the northern regions of Peninsular Malaysia. And the focus is both rural and uh, road transport. Nilai Inland Port is for the central region. And for the Segama Inland Port, the focus is for the feeder rails to Port Klang from shippers in the uh, south central regions. And lastly, the Tebedu Inland Port. So if you can see, Tebedu Inland Port is, uh, can be considered as the uh, true uh, dry port because it's provide link between uh, East Malaysia and Indonesian Kalimantan regions. And also the focus is for the local distribution between uh, Malaysia uh, and Indonesia. Okay, moving on to the strategic institutional framework. The main government bodies for inland port uh, in Malaysia include Minister of Transport, Minister of Finance, as well as the state governments. Um, the Ministry of Transport uh, will be in charge of the transportation part. 
uh, and also the governance of the inland port. In terms of licensing of inland port, it is under the custom department of Ministry of Finance. And in terms of uh, planning and monitoring, uh, all federal, state government, and also with some input from the industry were involved in the planning of uh, inland port in Malaysia. So going to the challenges and way forward, I said before, we are targeting to become the center for uh, distribution in Asia. So, but uh, basically I could say that in Malaysia, inland port is not so uh, appealing because the first reason would be that we have a very strategic uh, location of our seaport and it is also well connected to road and rail. So the product can go from the factories directly to the seaport. So that is why the inland port in Malaysia is not uh, very appealing. And uh, this also uh, costs uh, double handling costs when uh, the goods went to inland port. However, uh, the government of Malaysia do see the importance of uh, inland port in Malaysia because we are having a problem of cargo congestion at seaports and also uh, heavy usage of road network have uh, resulted in high traffic volume and also congestion and it has made the road condition in Malaysia uh, worse. Okay, as a way forward, in the national transport policy, we also have we have a plan on the development of transport integration hubs, and also have a master plan to prioritize intermodal transport, and also to develop a multi-modal plan. And there is also a plan on the hub and spoke model. So inland port will play a very vital role there. Uh, Multi-row operators, there is. Um, there is a plan to increase uh, competitiveness in rail operation by opening the, our rail operators uh, with the aim to increase efficiency and service offering. And there is an opportunity uh, for Malaysia to develop uh, an inland port uh, taking into the, the plan of the Singapore and Kuming rail link uh, that was going to be developed. So if there is an opportunity for Malaysia to open one inland port to serve this uh, road. And then also we will improve our road uh, network connectivity to get a better uh, last mile connectivity to fit uh, our inland port. So I think this is a very short presentation for me. Just a lens, short landscape there. And I think Ms. Reshma also have a full question. No, uh, Puan, thank you very much yes. for your presentation. So it, the button is very hot. There's been, uh, there, are, there are a whole bunch of questions for you in the Q&A. Uh, yes. But before we do that, we do still have one poll question that, uh, that will come out now before we start the Q&A with you. Yeah, if, anyone, if everyone can please answer this poll question. Okay, as, um, as we run through the Q&A questions, uh, we'll wait for the poll answers to come in. So the first question, Puan, this is from uh, Dr. Rosni from UMT. And uh, Dr. Rosni says, in Malaysia, there's, um, there are difficult and no interactions between the seaport and the interland port, uh, the inland port. How does the Ministry of Transport view uh, this and how would you be able to overcome this problem? I guess okay. the question here is what they're saying here is that um, there is a lack of uh, communication, probably cohesiveness between the inland ports and the seaports. So um, whether MOT would uh, has any, uh, you know, steps in order to try and yeah. Um, okay, sorry. I 
open the Q&A box. Basically, yes, uh, to answer the question, uh, MOT is uh, working to improve this uh, and all related issue has been outlined through, we have a national transport policy and also uh, apart from that, we also have uh, an engagement open uh, in terms of uh, uh, industries um, involvement. So through the, we have the National Logistic Task Force and also at the higher level is the Transport Council. Yeah. Okay, so we have these two, the task forces that are actually addressing these. Um, yes, the, we have the, that. Uh, and and uh, they are um, working towards uh, getting a cohesiveness between the seaports and the inland uh, terminals, yes, uh, exactly. the inland ports. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. Of course, there are three questions here, and we're only allowed to take two questions for now. We'll take the other questions later in the open Q&A. But I'll pick this one question up here. This is from uh, Johor okay. Port. And the question here from Inche Mohamed Nizar, it says under the, under the NTP, the National Transportation Policy of 2019-2013, uh, where is the proposed location for the transport integration hub? Yeah, I guess a lot of us are quite interested to know where this is going to be. Okay, um, basically we do have a plan for that, but we have not identified the exact location. But it is there in the action plans of the national transport policy. So, um, yeah, it, it is in plan, but I can't uh, say where's the exact location. Okay, uh, so okay. we have to be happy that it yeah. is planned. And it is planned, but it is planned. there is a location. So any idea strategically left, uh, north, south, east, west? Because that was one of the questions in the poll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can't really uh, answer it's that. Fine, uh, so, yeah. It's fine, ma'am. So it's fine, ma'am. It's okay. Uh, we understand. Uh, yes. Of course, this is under the. Uh, this is still under government's plan, and they will let exactly. us know in time, in due time. Yes. So we have but a no few. Worries, we have that. We have that in plan. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Maybe this is a good time to show the results of the poll, Rashna. Yes, I was just about to announce that. Um, this ah. is. Yeah, if you can see the results of the poll here where the question is, would Malaysia need another inland port? Looks like 43% uh, says yes. So it's good to know that MOT is working on that. Yes, we, we, we are working on that. Excellent. Thank you, Puan. Uh, thank you very much, Puan. Uh, we do still have a few other questions, but like I said, we will take these questions when we have um, uh, the floor open for Q&A for everyone. Uh, yes. Now I'd like to invite our second speaker and our second speaker is all the way from Netherlands. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Remco Berman. He is the CEO of the Holland International Distribution Council and he's going to talk to us about the role of inland ports and how Netherlands has transformed into Europe's uh, distribution hub. So I would like to pass the floor to you, Mr. Remco. Thank you very much, uh, Reshma and uh, good morning and good afternoon uh, everyone uh, i hope you are all doing well during these uh, uh, times of uh, corona covid 19 which uh, affects a lot of our uh, business uh, currently um may i have the next slide please uh, i first and the next one as well please uh, I first uh, like to introduce my uh, organization called HIDC, the Holland International Distribution Council. Uh, we are an association uh, for the logistics uh, industry, uh, promoting and representing the Dutch logistics industry uh, abroad. Um, <clears throat> we have around 300 uh, members and we are supported by the Dutch uh, government. Uh, and those 300 members, they can be divided in four main groups. First uh, group, uh, those are the uh, what we call the basic infrastructure in the Netherlands. So the ports, uh, the airports, the carriers, but also the inland ports. The second group, and that's the largest group, are the logistic service providers. Uh, that's about half of all our members, uh, the big ones like uh, DHL, uh, FedEx, uh, Geodis, uh, DB Schenker, etc., but also many smaller logistic companies. 
Um, the third group are the professional service suppliers. So those are tech specialists, uh, consultants, um, real estate developers uh, and the like. And the fourth type of members are the logistic hotspots in the Netherlands. Those are cities, those are regions where most of the logistic activities in the Netherlands take place. Next slide. Um, what do we do? Can, may I have the next slide, please? Um, what, one back, please. Um, what we, uh, can I have one slide back? Uh, what we uh, do is um, we give advice about uh, European supply chains. Uh, so we help foreign shippers who wants to develop want to develop a European supply chain in uh, in the Netherlands and for Europe. Uh, we deal with around uh, 400 new uh, projects per year. So those are foreign shippers starting their business uh, in Europe, and they they set up their European distribution out of the Netherlands. Most of those projects uh, come from uh, North America and, uh, and Asia. And when we look at Asia, most of those projects uh, come from, uh, from Japan and, uh, and China. But Southeast Asia is uh, growing as well. The number of projects from Southeast Asia, uh, mainly Singapore, Thailand and, uh, and Malaysia. And uh, in the past, we have been working with some Malaysian companies active in uh, in the wood industry and in the rubber industry to help them set, uh, develop their European supply chains. Next slide, please. Um, the importance of logistics in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, when you look at the value of imports from outside the EU, um, you can see that the Netherlands is the third largest importer of goods outside the EU after Germany and uh, the UK. Next slide, please. Um, but when you look at the uh, import value per capita, uh, the Netherlands is uh, four times higher than uh, UK and, uh, and Germany. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have around 17 million inhabitants in Germany it's 83 million and in the UK 66 million uh, inhabitants so uh, there are four times more about five times more uh, inhabitants in uh, in Germany and they have only slightly more imports that's also uh, the reason uh, why Rotterdam is actually the largest port of uh, of Germany uh, of Germany uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, uh, more goods are being imported via the port of uh, Rotterdam than uh, via the ports of, uh, of uh, Germany, like uh, Bremen and, uh, and Hamburg. So this shows uh, how important the Netherlands is as a distribution hub for the rest of, uh, of Europe. Next slide, please. That also means that the uh, Dutch government uh, they are working with nine top sectors. So uh, we have a top sector policy, which means that the Dutch ministry is uh, focusing to further develop nine main industries in, uh, in the Netherlands. And one of those uh, sectors is the logistics uh, industry. And the logistics industry has a specific feature because it's not only an industry in itself, but it's also facilitating all of the other eight top sectors eh, because logistics is needed to bring the goods from A to B. Um, the focus in our top sector policy in the Netherlands is uh, really on innovation and sustainability and the government does so by stimulating the triple helix uh, cooperation. So cooperation between the knowledge institutes uh, the business community and the government itself. And in that way, we try to become as innovative and sustainable as possible. Uh, before we go to the next slide, I would like to put out a, a poll uh, question. And the poll question uh, is, well, you can read it here. Uh, how many square meters of distribution centers do you think we have in, uh, in the Netherlands approximately? 
everyone fills in the question. May I have the answers, please? Is that already possible? Let's give it a few seconds, uh, Remco. Let me do a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, poll is closed and it will come up. The results will come up in a moment. Okay, perfect. Well, next slide, please. There you can read the answer as well. Okay, and uh, I can see that most of you uh, have the answer correct. It's uh, uh, almost uh, 35 million square meters of, uh, of warehouse. Uh, and that shows how important uh, the logistics industry is in, uh, in the Netherlands. Because you have to realize that the Netherlands is a very small country as well. Uh, if, if you drive from west to east, it will only take you two hours. If you drive from north to south of the Netherlands, it will only take you three hours. So um, it means that that's a lot of warehouse uh, space in such a small uh, country. Uh, approximately 10% of our GDP and about 10% uh, of the uh, uh, labor force is employed in the logistics uh, industry. Um, this uh, rise in, uh, in warehouse space is mainly caused by, well, first of all, the economic growth in the past uh, 10 years, but another trend you can see in, uh, in Holland is the growth of, uh, of e-commerce, and that's also one of the reasons uh, the number of warehouses uh, increased uh, so dramatically. Uh, when we look at our industry now in times of, uh, of Corona, the, the, uh, the picture is a little bit uh, mixed. Uh, some of the, uh, well, most of the logistic companies are still doing quite well, especially if they are active in e-commerce, in, in life sciences, in agro-food. Uh, most, uh, a lot of them, most of them, of those companies actually have more business than they had before. Uh, but we also see some logistic companies who have really problems. Uh, think of uh, automotive, think of flowers. Uh, they are really facing some uh, major problems now. Can I have the next slide, uh, please? So what's the reason why the Netherlands became such a logistic hotspot in the Netherlands? Well, first of all, it's, it's the location. Uh, in this picture, uh, which uh, you can see the map of, uh, of Europe and you see a blue banana, it's also called the blue banana, and that's where you can find most of the purchasing power in, uh, in Europe. And so that's where the consumers are, and right in the middle is, uh, is the Netherlands, uh, in between the three major markets, uh, UK, Germany, and, uh, and France. Uh, when you uh, make a circle around the Netherlands, uh, we have around 170 million consumers within 500 kilometers, and in a radius of 1,000 kilometers, we have 250 million uh, consumers. So that, that's a lot. So the location, of course, is very important. And this study by uh, Prologis shows that, well, the, the most red area here on this map, those are the logistic, the most favorable desirable logistic locations in the Netherlands, um, they are the red areas. And that's, that's, well, the whole of Holland is actually almost uh, red. May I have the next slide, uh, please? So the first reason is the location. The second reason is, of course, the entry points to the European markets. And we are very happy, may I have the next slide? Uh, we are very happy to have three main ports in, uh, in the Netherlands. First one is the port of, uh, of Rotterdam. That's the 10th the largest port in the world. Actually, the, the other nine are based in, uh, in Asia and most of them in China and, and Singapore as, uh, as well. But the uh, port of Rotterdam still ranking 10th in the world and number one in Europe uh, with a turnover of uh, 470 million tons in, uh, in 2019 and almost 15 million uh, in, in, uh, uh, as, as, as a turnover. Uh, secondly, it's not only the seaport, but also our airport is very important in that respect. Uh, it's the third largest uh, cargo airport in, uh, in Europe, uh, 1.5 million tons, so that's much less, of course, uh, in, than, than a seaport. Um, but a much higher value, of course, and they have 30, uh, 332 
destinations in, uh, in Europe. And becoming more and more important is also the internet exchange. Uh, that, that's part of the digital infrastructure and uh, the digital infrastructure is becoming more and more important uh, in uh, logistics uh, these days uh, because digitization is really taking over the, uh, the industry. Also, port and airport are affected by uh, COVID-19. Uh, in Port of Rotterdam, we see a decrease in volumes. Also, in the, port of, uh, in, in the airport of Amsterdam, we see a decrease in, in volumes. But we see that the number of full freighters, uh, that means a, an airplane full of, uh, of goods, uh, of cargo, uh, has increased with 100%. So we see a decrease in the volumes, but that is mainly because there are almost no passenger flights with cargo in, uh, in the belly. May I have the next slide, uh, please? So we have one and two, that's the entry points, the ports, uh, the location in Europe. But the third one, which is very important, is the multimodal network. Well, as uh, I've just explained, most of the goods are entering the European market via the Port of Rotterdam, much more than via the airport. And uh, there is an extensive multimodal network uh, to, uh, to the hinterland. First of all, that's by road, railway, and by rivers. Uh, we, have, uh, we are in the middle of a delta, so there is uh, a lot of uh, inland waterways in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and we try to uh, optimize the use of those three modalities. Actually, at the moment, uh, we try to move from road to inland shipping and, uh, and rail. Uh, currently, uh, we have around 50% of the goods from the port of uh, Rotterdam. They are transferred to the hinterland by road, about 38% by inland shipping and about 12% by, uh, by rail. We want to increase the rail from 12 to 20% in 2030. The inland shipping from 38 to 45 in 2030. So we want to reduce the road transport from 50 to 35%. Then I have the next question for, uh, for the poll uh, because I want to elabor elaborate a little bit more about on the inland ports. So uh, how many inland terminals do you think? How many inland container terminals uh, do we uh, have been developed in, uh, in the Netherlands approximately, you think? The answers will come out in the next few seconds. Uh, yeah, would you we like can go to, to the next slide in the meantime. Yeah. We can go to the next slide. Here you see the, uh, the blue road, the inland waterways network. Uh, on the top left, you see a map of the Netherlands with a lot of the inland ports, uh, not all of them. And then you see the extensive network uh, to the rest of Europe. So you can see that from Rotterdam, you can even uh, sail to, uh, to the Black Sea uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Bulgaria. Um, it would be inland enough. ports. Yeah, all questions the, if we get the poll answers now. Yeah, we can see the poll answers now. Okay, most of you are correct. Uh, indeed, we. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, you are not correct uh, because the total number of inland ports is uh, is 40. So we have around 40 inland container terminals in uh, in the Netherlands. Um, there are around uh, 200, more than 250 inland ports in uh, in the Netherlands. Most of them. They are uh, for uh, sand and, uh, and gravel, and also for, uh, for liquid bulk. But we also have around 40 inland container, on container terminals, which means that the, uh, the containers, they enter the port of Rotterdam, and then they are being transferred to one of those con ter container terminals. Often they are connected to a, a distribution uh, hub. So you have warehouses around such an inland terminal, uh, L value is added, and uh, then they are being uh, redistributed throughout the rest of, uh, of Europe. And so those inland terminals, they often are connected to warehouses, but also to rail and road connections. Uh, may I have the next slide, uh, please? 
as volumes are, are growing uh, over the years, uh, efficiency is becoming more and more important because uh, otherwise, uh, of course, congestion may be expected. Uh, so there are several ways uh, to deal with that. A very important one is also the uh, digital information exchange. So exchange of information was one of the questions asked earlier between uh, the seaport and, and the, actually the container terminals at the seaport and the inland uh, terminals. I think uh, uh, Dr. Larissa also will elaborate on, uh, on that a little bit more. And another example I would like to uh, mention is the cooperation in, in the corridor. What they are currently working on is really bundling uh, cargo volumes in the corridor. So that means that uh, you bundle at the seaport when you distribute to the corridor, uh, you bundle the, uh, the uh, containers. Uh, and secondly, also when you come from different uh, containers in the terminal, they also bundle before they go back to the uh, sea terminal, um, which means you need uh, less vessels and the uh, sea terminal, because the volume of uh, vessels has uh, decreased, they can offer fixed windows. Uh, so they have a certain time slot when they can uh, when they can offer their containers to the uh, sea terminal, which means in the end, you have less vessels coming to the sea terminal and also less congestion. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so I mentioned the, the different uh, reasons why the melons developed into a hot, hot spot. Uh, the first three I, I already uh, elaborated on. Um, I also would like to mention the world-class fiscal and business uh, environment. So customs plays a very important uh, role in that respect. We have a very business-friendly uh, uh, customs uh, authority in uh, the Netherlands who tries to make the process as smooth as, uh, as possible. Uh, there's a lot of competition because the logistics industry is so well developed and a lot of competition means that there are many specialized services, value-added services that can be offered. And also that the cost quality ratio is, uh, is very good in, uh, in the Netherlands. And finally, uh, the uh, innovation uh, is also very important to remain competitive in, uh, in the future by uh, implementing digitization and automation in the logistics industry. And that way the efficiency can be uh, further improved. Well, May I have the next slide? The, the proof of the pudding is in the, in the eating, of course. And when we look at different uh, rankings, how we score uh, in the Netherlands in different uh, studies, and you see we are in a lot of the, uh, the studies, we rank number uh, one, uh, quality of roads, uh, the efficiency train services, uh, the quality air transportation, etc. Uh, so we do everything to stay ahead and uh, to remain the logistics hub in, uh, in Europe. Thank Next you, slide, Mr. please. Uh, uh, Mr. Remco, we have a couple of questions as well waiting Perfect. in line. Um, are you uh, a couple of slides over uh, to, towards the end of your session? I'm actually, I'm finished. All right, excellent. I'll let you finish. Uh, I am finished, yeah. All this right. is my final Ex slide. So. Right, so we've got, okay. we, thank you very much. So sorry to cut you in like that. Um, it's, uh, we have a, a question from a Mr. Azran Dareman, and um, he took into account of your slideshow where you uh, showed the connection for the One Belt, One Road, um, you know, uh, uh, in terms of the inland port connections uh, with the rail link. He says here, Malaysia does have good prospects in developing inland ports and uh, for the access into not just ASEAN, but, you know, pretty much looking at the one belt, one road. We have a link all the way up to Europe. So um, the question here is, how can Netherlands help us facilitate um, an inland uh, port that would be of the same standard as yours? So I believe that's the question. They would like to know what elements or what would be what would form as part of the strategic plan in order for Malaysia to address this, you know, develop an inland port that would be connected in the similar manner? Well, I think um, 
uh, um, we are always uh, willing uh, to share our experiences. So, of course, uh, we need to elaborate a little bit more on that uh, and, and to know exactly what the situation is in, in Malaysia currently. But, of course, and I think that's also something our ambassador uh, uh, offered beforehand, we are always uh, willing to share our experience and see how uh, Malaysia can learn from the Netherlands but also the other way around how we can learn from your experience in Malaysia. Okay, and there is one, one more question. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Remco. But this other question is also in your slideshow. Um, you have showed uh, the percentage of volume that comes in by sea, uh, that goes by road, that's interconnected by the road transportation and the rail transportation. And then you also indicated um, the um, goals uh, in terms of what Netherlands wants to move a higher percentage from road to rail. Uh, we'd like to understand, is there any incentivization that's being done? Because uh, we have that issue here back at home uh, where the road transport sector is more competitive than the rail transport. So what does the government there incentivize the shift from road to rail? Uh, that that's a very uh, a very good question. I have to say, um, I do not know exactly the answer. Answer, but I know there's a lot of uh, 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 stimulation from from the port, and also in the investment uh, projects, to uh, to work towards uh, this uh, this goal. Uh, so uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Dr. Larissa knows a little bit more about it. Okay, Not thank sure. you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. So that now brings us to our final speaker for the day. And our final speaker as well is all the way from Netherlands. Uh, she is Dr. Larissa Van der Lucht, and she is the director of uh, Erasmus Center of Urban Port and Transport Economics from the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. I would like to now pass the mic to her, the floor to her, for her to give her presentation. Dr. Larissa? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and for being invited to this, uh, this webinar. And actually, we would start also with uh, putting two questions uh, to the audience. So maybe we could start uh, with that. Is this sufficient time for answering? Yeah, I believe everyone has answered. Are you going to wait for the um, answers to come out, uh, come out uh, doctor, or would you like to start your presentation? I would like to start and come back to the questions at the end of the presentation. Excellent, uh, please go ahead then. The floor is so yours. then I'm going to, to share my, uh, my screen. Okay, you're on. Yes. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for the introduction and, and being invited. Uh, indeed, my name is Larissa van der Lucht and uh, working at uh, Erasmus University and actually at uh, an institute, uh, Erasmus Center for Urban Port and Transport Economics. And we are involved in uh, both research and education in this field of, of port economics, transport economics, and uh, doing that actually at the crossroads of academic uh, knowledge development, but also industry practice. We do a lot of researches for, uh, well, let's say ministries, uh, port authorities, uh, where we try to, to bring our knowledge uh, to the industry. And uh, well, this topic is, is part of my expertise, so uh, very much uh, uh, liking to, to share my views on this. 
And I think it's very well connects to what has been presented uh, before. And what I would like to do is to go into a couple of challenges and success factors that we see uh, for the development of the uh, inland network in the, in the Netherlands. And I will do that within 10 minutes. So uh, really trying to, to highlight the, the major important things. And that actually comes to three uh, things. Um, it is about having the logical network and also physically. It is about the organizational integration and it is about data exchange and provision. Let's say the, the software of the uh, organization of the networks. And I go into that. So first, uh, the logical network. Of course, it's not about just an inland terminal and inland depot. It's about developing uh, the whole network and positioning the inland um, ports in such a way that they connect very well with the whole network system that you would like to connect. And you see here the picture of the Netherlands and where we really developed such a corridor-based development. Uh, all the dots are the um, multimodal uh, centers. Some of them are more satellite ports. Some of them are more, um, let's say, really hubs uh, because we should distinguish between the different types of inlet ports. Uh, that was already also addressed uh, from ministry side. And where you see the satellite ports maybe closer to the to the ports, they can also be more in the in the inland, uh, but they distinguish from, for example, a load center that really has a function further inland to service a regional uh, market which is there. And then the last one is rather a transmodal center or an exchange center which really serves as a hub uh, on the crossroads of different inland corridors that you would like to, uh, to connect. It's always important to connect then with the market uh, and that you have a local market base around it. Um, another thing that I would like to highlight, the logical network, that's about the scale. Um, if we look at the inland um, container port development in the, in the Netherlands, the scale was sometimes based upon a financial uh, assessment of such an inland port and you can maybe get it break even with a certain amount of container movements that you handle uh, if you relate that to the investment but what is more important if you look at the skill is that you look at it from a service perspective and I think uh, that, that if you look at the, the see that trains may be running uh, each day, I think that should be the, uh, the the way to look at it. What frequency can you offer in the service between the port and the inland port that is sufficient for the market? And that starts, I think, with three times a week, four times a week. But that means that you need the skill at the inland location to have a full train running at such a um, frequency. So, sorry. Skill should be looked at from a service perspective. Um, and that brings me to the next um, point, that the development of an inland port should go hand in hand with the development of the industrial or uh, logistical area around it. Uh, if you have the space for warehouse development, uh, for maybe other logistical or manufacturing facilities that creates a local cargo base that makes the uh, development of the inland port viable. And that also holds for the um, potential empty bed depots of carriers. And for carriers, it's an issue to deal in a good way with their empty assets, with their empty containers. And instead of having to bring them each time back to the port, you may want to use them for uh, balancing better the inflows and the outflows of cargo. So having empty container depots from carriers in the vicinity of an inland port could help the usage of the inland port also by the carriers. But then I come to the organizational part, which I think is one of the most relevant. And it's also already brought up by one of the uh, participants in this webinar with a, with a question. Uh, it is about integration. And it's about having the right organization of the whole 
network. Uh, and it starts, of course, with who is going to invest in an inland in an inner port. And what we see in the Netherlands is that the development of these ports uh, have been boosted by the investment by private companies, private multimodal companies uh, that have their expertise in model, multimodal uh, transportation, have their expertise in terminal operations, investing in these inland terminals, hand in hand, maybe by the local government, also maybe hand in hand by the port authority that also has an interest in a good inland uh, multimodal network uh, that, that can uh, have a stake in that. But the primary investor is the private company. What you then have is competition uh, and, and, and competition enhances innovation and, and efficiency. At the same time, you have to look at how do all these actors work together? And what we've seen in the Netherlands is that all of a sudden, it was already highlighted uh, by Mr. Bruman that we have um, 40 container uh, depots in the Netherlands. If you relate that back to what I just said about having the frequency and the skill, well, we may, we may have ended up a little bit with too much inland depots. So what you see now is that these companies are looking for cooperation, not only vertically in the chain, but horizontally. And that was already brought up. So you see these different colors, and those are terminals from the same company. And so you see that there is an integration taking place by having companies coordinating more than one in a depot, but there's also cooperation between the ter different terminal companies uh, where they try to cooperate via an alliances or a cooperative agreement. And then indeed, uh, what's being said before, they bundle their cargo and smoothen the, the whole operation, both in the hinterland and within the port, as to get an efficient operation. One of the things uh, what you have to look at is how this whole chain is structured, who has what responsibility, but also how the transactional interactions are being structured. And what we see is that, and I don't know how this is in Malaysia, but in the Netherlands, this was really a thing to overcome, is that there is a lack of contractual agreement between the deep sea terminal and the inland uh, operator, and be it the rail operator or the barge operator, um, they are not by commercial contract connected with each other. It is the deep sea uh, carrier that actually has the contract with the container terminal operator and that pays for the transshipment at the deep sea terminal, the storage, but also for the movement of the container on to the next mode. Uh, so if you want to have an functional or operational integration between two actors. They, they do not have any commercial uh, contractual agreement. Well, then you have to put in place different mechanisms to make sure that those operations are well aligned so that the train runs in time at the terminal where it can be handled uh, by the crew of the deep sea terminal, which is ready to do that. And that all these operations are um, being aligned and that, that if something is distorted there that you can have the discussions or the agreements to to make it work better next time so that is something that you have to to, to look at that you have the vertical integration between the actors in order to get the efficient operations done and that you also look at how is this all institutionally structured And then I actually come to the to the last thing, and that is uh, logically related to to the integration that you need to establish organizationally, is the role the very important role of uh, information, information availability, information exchange. And so you need to have the right facilities underlying this whole system, and of course that is also about inspection, custom custom clearance, hey, you may want to do that in the inland location, not within the port, having the facilities over there, but it also comes down to having the right information exchange. And that also relates to smart planning tools. In order to plan this whole process in a well way, integrating all these actors, 
you need to develop the smart planning tools. And that can only be done if the information is there. And what has been developed in, in, in Rotterdam, for example, are a couple of tools. Uh, there is the com Port Community Exchange System, which is called PortBase, where all information coming from the deep sea carriers, from the terminals, but also about the inland connections are being put in one, one platform and everybody can connect to it and can make use of it. But there are other platforms developed. And Navigate is one of the platforms um, that was initiated by the Port of Rotterdam. It has the information of all the inland ports, con inland container ports in the Netherlands about their capacities, their opening hours, uh, but also some other performance attributes. And it connects to these services. So if you have a container that you would like to have transported between the port to the hinterland, you can go to navigate, uh, type in what your requirements are, and then the possibilities pop up and you can make your choice. And the working of that platform um, is really founded by the fact that all these actors commit themselves to providing the information to the platform. That's the only way that it can, uh, can work. And a last uh, development that we have, uh, that have been done uh, late, and I said we, because it was done in a combination between the Port Authority, between one of the deep sea terminals, and we as Erasmus also um, supported it with uh, bringing in some knowledge from our side, but we looked into reliability. And what was being developed was also again a platform where information from the different actors, the deep sea terminal, the barge operator, the inland terminal, but also the final shipper was brought in. And what we could do was following container exactly from the port up to the uh, final customer and back. And that then over a period of time and over a whole set of containers and that provides you with information about reliability reliability in the port and so to what extent uh, is the transit time reliable in the port can you count on that the container is there for maybe only two days and that holds also for the inland lag uh, can you count on that it takes only six hours up to the inland terminal and again what time does it take for the container to stay and being handled at the inland terminal so bringing together that information, providing that also to the users again, is a starting base for the discussion about uh, improving that whole, that whole process. Um, well, those are, I think, the major uh, focuses that uh, all the actors have been put on developing the, the inland network up to now. It's still improvements that, that can be made. But, well, if I then would like to conclude it, I would say um, it's three things. It's having the right network physically, logically uh, position of the inland depots towards the networks that you would like to make uh, accessible. But it's all about the organizational integration where the integration and analysis of information is really key in order to make, uh, make improvements. So that was it. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I hope to uh, have uh, some interesting questions. Oh, yes, you do, Dr. Larissa. Thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. There were a lot of questions that I noticed in your presentation. You were actually answering these questions already. Uh, but however, there is this one uh, very um, interesting question here by uh, Dr. Jagan from UNT. And uh, Dr. Jagan asked that, um, during the COVID-19 out outbreak, most of the seaports, because of the volume drops, right? So most of the seaports were uh, urged um, to look at their profits, not so much on volume, but mostly towards uh, value-added activities. So how would this, for instance, how would this then sit together with a development of an inland port in this, in this manner? Would, uh, would, there, would there need to be some form of cooperation uh, and if, for instance, the inland port is uh, another entity, that means it's another private entity that has that is running this inland port, how do you then get this cooperation working? Um, yeah, I think it starts by seeing this not as really competitive elements, but uh, as a 
system that strengthens each other. And what we have learned in the Netherlands is that by having, you need that uh, inland transportation network to strengthen the position of the port. Uh, because it's for the shipper uh, of most importance to have its cargo in a smooth, efficient, cost efficient, but also reliable way to its final customer. And you can have your advantages uh, uh, by making use of rail and in our case of barge because it is reliable large-scale transport that connects then the port in a uh, efficient way to the hinterland. It can be cheaper because of the scale and it can be more reliable because what we also have seen is the development of congestion at the roads around the port that you would like to avoid. So we've even seen uh, road transport operators starting their inland terminal and for example, a barge service up to that inland terminal and from then on delivering their trucking services to the customer. So these companies switched actually from trucking being trucking companies to into model companies. Thank you very much. So you're saying that um, generally what um, uh, what you're saying here is that number one, you should not be looking at the competitive element here. It should be something where you support each other because it would be um, uh, it would be um, in a sense that you're taking off these loads away and um, that companies that are currently uh, that are looking at uh, setting up uh, an inland port that it should extend their services with trucking. Do I understand? Is that what you're trying to communicate, uh, doctor? Uh, yes, and, and, and maybe I can add something. Yes. Um, maybe underlying this question was also, uh, is there not a kind of competition for attracting warehouses either to the port or to the inland uh, location? Uh, but in the Netherlands, we've seen that with the development of, of many warehouses more inland, uh, close to these inland uh, depots, that that has boosted the position of the Netherlands as a gateway to further Europe. Because what is handled within these warehouses is, uh, to a large extent, re-export again to other, uh, to other countries. Because yeah. we have these facilities that attracted additional cargo to the port of Rotterdam. Yes, there's, it, it's one of the main entry points, right, into Europe. Uh, there's yeah. another question, Dr. Dow, uh, from your pr presentation when, um, and I, th I think this question was even uh, asked somewhere in between where we spoke about, um, um, you know, who should be the party? Should it be the government that sets up this inland port or should it be uh, the private sector? So we have a question from Ms. Noor Ayn. Uh, and she says, uh, how would you encourage and motivate private sector investment and local government participation for the success of an inland network or an inland port? Um, yeah, in the first place, there should be uh, business in it, of course. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's, also that it should be a good cooperation between those two actors uh, because you need to have the right space logically located to the infrastructure uh, and whether it's road infrastructure or real infrastructure or combi ideally a combination of both. So uh, I think that will be the local government that should be there uh, providing for the, the, the right space and maybe also the infrastructure facilities and that can make it attractive for a private company to invest then in rather the operations. It starts of course with uh, that there should be a market and there should be a business in it. Um, but I think that the, the, the most important thing for a private company is once the business is there, that it has the uh, idea that there is a supporting government that uh, at least facilitates uh, its development uh, so that there is indeed the space, the infrastructure, but also in terms of regulation and legislation that that is smoothly done so that they can get their licenses so that they can indeed do their business in a, in a, in a, yeah, in a stable way. Okay, thank you very much. So there, 
government must be there because to facilitate the private sector, the private sector cannot go about it alone, <laughs> from what I understand. Yeah. yeah All right. And, Sorry, uh, carry on. What we have seen also in the Netherlands is uh, the relevance of the Port Authority being one of the stakeholders in there because it's in their interest and they can also play a role, maybe not in being the one that really invests in the terminal, although it takes place in the Netherlands sometimes, if that's needed, but at least they can play a role in the integrating it better and also with their expertise to see what is needed to, to develop at the inland place to make it a good integration. Thank you. All right, just for the benefit of everybody, because you're the one with the doctor at your name, Dr. Larissa. So you, <laughs> there is this question where they're asking the difference between an inland port and an inland container depot. Uh, they're saying, is, is there any difference to that? Is it the same thing or are they different in any way? An inland port and an inland container depot. Yeah, it's always difficult with those definitions. Uh, if we talk about an inland port in the Netherlands, it can also be, uh, let's say, where, and, uh, where we uh, transship bulk cargoes like coal or iron ore or sand. Uh, so you have to distinguish between an inland port and between an inland container port. And if we take the inland container port, uh, then you have different types. What I said, it's satellite terminal, or it can be an inland container transshipment hub. Yeah. And you have the empty container depots of the uh, shipping lines, yeah. Shipping lines, yeah. and which they establish and invest in by them by themselves. So if we talk about an inland container depot, I would see an, an inland container port the better word because that also assumes that multitude of functions and it's more than just a depot. Yeah, so uh, it brings us to uh, a question that says then can, can an inland port also be known as a economic corridor? So which means commercial, uh, you know, trade and a free commercial zone or a free trade zone can be within this, within the inland port. Uh, yeah, I think it's always good to look at the uh, opportunity of combining an, an inland port with a uh, free zone. time of, of development. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Larissa. I believe now it is time because we're getting really close towards the end of the session. So we're going to now open the Q&A to the floor. First However, Mark, can I please inter interrupt yeah, for sure. a moment? Uh, we still owe you the results of the polls just now. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, doctor. We, Your polls. Give it out? Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, well, so Dr. I... Larissa, uh, is it the same in, in, in Netherlands? Is the delay mostly in the port? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. There is the, the, yeah, there's the, the universal story. problem, yeah? yeah. And yeah. Uh, investment for inland terminals? Uh, well, in the Netherlands, it's definitely not the uh, central government. It's a combination of local oh. government rather in the site and then and the, the private sector. The uh, private sector, yeah. And sometimes, if it's really a, a strategic location and, uh, for example, there is some issue over there, it may be that the Port Authority also um, well, steps in. Okay, thank you very much. So are we ready to start taking questions from the floor? And um, we do have a live call from one of our speakers. Uh, right, if, if you can advise us who you would like to bring into the uh, session, can you please, then we can uh, ask them to unmute. Uh, yeah, can we please get Mr. Marco Tierman? Uh, okay. to unmute and um, join in and ask your question live, please. My pleasure. Okay, that's working already. Marco, please go ahead. Professor Marco Timon. Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the great presentations. I have a question for Juan Anis. Um, there is a halal logistics standard, MS 2400, uh, the standard <laughs> for halal supply chain management. This standard was introduced in the year mm. 2010. Is there an opportunity for halal logistics services in inland ports? And is there also a halal policy currently with the, within the ministry? Uh, okay, thank you for the questions, um, Professor Timon. Yes, uh, in terms of 
uh, Hala Logistics Services in Inland Port? Yes, uh, we welcome if there is any private initiative wants to go and open up uh, Halal Services such as you said, offering of ritual cleansing in the container, in the inland uh, port, and also uh, in terms of policy decision, yeah, in, in our national transport policy, we do have a plan on um, developing uh, a framework for halal logistics for the land and uh, warehousing sector, and that could be extended into the inland port, of course. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to get a few more questions and um, before we see if there's anyone else that's going to come in live. Um, this other question, um, one of the questions that were asked in the session was how many inland ports, um, I mean in the Q&A, well, how many inland ports does um, Netherlands have? And Mr. Remco, you answered that question already. You have 40 uh, 40 inland um, uh, ports there. And um, uh, there was another question about the difference between a uh, container terminal and uh, a port, and I, I've, uh, sorry, an inland depot, container depot and an inland port. And Dr. Larissa, you already answered that question. Yeah. Um, the, uh, most of the questions that I, I, I noticed that's coming in from Malaysia seems to be pertaining to our limitations in the rail services that um, uh, tend to increase road congestion, road traffic congestion. So um, maybe we can open this uh, question to um, MOT to see how we can address this uh, because uh, from what I notice, I mean, there are about three, four questions here, and most of them tend to refer to um, the, uh, uh, the rail link connection in the inland port situation, saying that there aren't enough um, locomotives, uh, insufficient capacity, limited train services, which are increasing the road congestion. Um, one question was, does Netherlands uh, have this problem. The other question uh, is also uh, directed to MOT on how do we address this? How do we make the ship? So maybe we get MOT to answer first. If one Anis, you can answer, and then we'll open that same question to get our um, insights from uh, from our experts from Netherlands. Okay, uh, regarding the connectivity, as I said before in my presentation, we do face that problem in terms of uh, the connectivity and the congestion of road and rail into the ports. But we are addressing it in our national transport policy and there's also already um, projects in, uh, in terms of uh, connectivity to the port line and also the Penang port. We are addressing that problem. So I believe um, in, in the short time, maybe in two or three years, this problem is going to be solved. Okay, okay that's good to know. Thank you very much, uh, Poen. Um, can, we, uh, can we understand if you have similar or did you have similar um, issues as this in Netherlands? And maybe we can learn a little bit from your best practices on how you were able to address these situations either uh, Mr. Remco or Dr. La uh, Larissa can help answer this. Uh, doctor, maybe you've got to put your mic on. Yeah, um, well, if I may give a first reaction, um, I think in the Netherlands, it's not a issue of um, capacity of having too little assets or not having the, uh, the, the tracks, but it is uh, what we do see uh, because uh, we've learned that the uh, share of rail transport is still at about 12%, uh, which is not really, and we would like to have it higher as well, but uh, the challenge is really business-wise. Uh, you compete with road transport, and especially if it's cargo within the Netherlands that goes uh, to somewhere in the Netherlands or to Germany, which is relatively close by. We talk about 200, 300 kilometers at the max, and then it's regionally distributed. So that's very well done also by 
a road transport and then uh, it's about the competition so for the capacity to be there to and i told also it's about frequency so if you want to have a train running each day with a good capacity well you need to have sufficient volume as a real transporter and you need to compete well with the road transport and and that is the uh, is the challenge yeah uh, it is it's like the chicken and egg situation isn't it dr larissa right? yeah, trying to move <laughs> moving the loads on um uh, if uh, there is also, uh, if you don't mind, doctor, if I can ask uh, Mr. Remco this question, there's a question from him, for him. Uh, it says here, uh, most of the time, aside, uh, aside from reliability of train services, mm -hmm. double handling also plays a massive uh, role in this in terms of the cost, logistics cost. Um, how do you resolve this in terms of uh, reducing double handling cost? You know, you would... You're putting in now another uh, mode of transport in between from what has been a C road uh, mode or combination. Now it's uh, the idea here is a C rail road combination. So how would that address double handling charges or costs? Well, uh, something which is uh, quite interesting is it's uh, one of the slides I've uh, shown as, uh, as well about the uh, col collaboration in the corridor. I was talking about uh, bundling uh, containers. Uh, that also means that uh, some of the uh, container terminals, uh, which have uh, more inland, uh, inland terminals, they actually bundle their uh, containers in a port just uh, outside uh, the port of, uh, of Rotterdam, which means uh, there is more handling activities but the uh, advantage of having more handling uh, before going finally to the port means that the reliability of the service can increase because less vessels have to enter the, uh, the seaport. So this is a, a nice uh, example, I think, where you can see that by a good cooperation between a port and inland terminals, uh, in, this, uh, in this case, you have more reliability, but more handling before the containers go to the port. Okay, you're, you're, you're referring to when you have an outbound, right? An export movement. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. That's All right, right. Um, if you don't mind, uh, we have a couple of uh, attendees who would like to ask their questions live. Uh, the first person, if you can, um, uh, Inche Azran, Raman, if you don't mind coming on live, turning on your mic, and um, if you could ask your questions. Okay, let's see if we can get him on. Inchi Azran Diraman. Okay, I think. Um, I think he's unmuted right now, Mr. Azran. Hello, can you hear yeah. me? Yes, yeah. Ajaran, yeah. go okay. ahead. Okay, good afternoon. Okay, I want to share, bro, in terms of, uh, from my perspective, after I saw some uh, your presentation, in terms of Malaysia development of inland, I see this uh, effort should uh, derive by the central government and also by the state government because in Malaysia, the land issue uh, comes under the state government. So both uh, the idea how the inland port uh, must uh, follow the central government. So the involvement of state government must go together to fulfill, uh, to achieve the, we call the success of uh, the project of inland. And then in terms of specific uh, location, to share with you, uh, for example, the state of Kelantan in Malaysia, we are neighbor to the Thailand side. So the strategic location, I think we can start the inland port in like the area of uh, Rauta Panjang and also another, another area that we can have a prospect, good prospect for inland port in uh, Padang Besar in Perlis. That's all. Okay, do I understand it's, uh, you're just giving us an insight, is it Encik Azran? There's no real question, there's no question there, is there a question? Yeah, to share that. 
All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that insight. Um, and yes, um, uh, it, situation is slightly a bit different here. Um, we do have uh, another poll coming out um, in a few seconds, I believe. And uh, once we get this poll question, the polls up. Oh, there you go. So um, the poll questions here are referring to logistics in maritime. We've asked uh, if there's any uh, additional areas that you'd be interested to work together with the Netherlands and the digitalization refers to logistics and maritime digitalization. You can select any number. There's not just one selection. You can select any number of answers that you're interested to work together with the Netherlands. And we have one more live uh, attendee, one more, so I mean all of y'all are live, but I mean we have one attendee more who would like to um, ask, ask his question live. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Jigan. Dr. Jigan, you have a lot of questions in our Q&A. Thank you so much. If you have unmuted your mic, doctor, um, please do uh, go ahead and um, Ask yeah, your question. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Reshma and uh, all the panelists. It was a very uh, interesting presentation from all of you. But that's my, uh, my concern is about the, uh, in some regions, especially in, our, in, in Malaysia, the ecosystem between seaports and the dry ports are not very well integrated. So what is your view or your opinion to create a significant symbiosis between uh, dry port and seaport uh, because as you know without seaport the dry port cannot or the inland terminals they cannot sustain and same same goes without inland terminal the seaport cannot achieve a higher competitiveness so there are some symbiosis exists there so in your point of view uh, how the this kind of integration or this kind of uh, collaboration between inland terminals and seaport can be achieved thank you so this question is directed to either, right? Anyone yes, in the panel? Yes, anyone. Yes. Okay. Who would like to answer? I can say something about it. Uh, yes, thank you. Please, yes. Remco. Um, I, I think you took the right uh, conclusion uh, to, uh, in, in order to get an uh, optimal functioning uh, uh, eco logistics ecosystem, uh, cooperation is, uh, is key uh, and coordination uh, is as well. Uh, that's the only way to, to uh, optimize uh, cargo flows and uh, to, uh, to increase the uh, efficiency. Well, uh, how can you do that? Uh, we have the advantage here in the Netherlands that, that we are uh, quite a small country, so it's quite easy to get connected and to stay connected. Uh, uh, and and um, what we try to do is, is mainly uh, to convince everyone that it's uh, a mutual interest to cooperate, cooperate and to collaborate uh, as well. And, and well, that would be my uh, suggestion. Uh, it, it is also in the interest of the seaport to have uh, information exchange with, uh, with the, uh, dry port, the inland dry ports. Uh, and it's very important to convince them uh, uh, to, to set up this collaboration. Yeah. Okay. If, yes, if doctor, I, go ahead. Well, I may add, I think um, it, it is also uh, taking up that responsibility. If I look at the Port of Rotterdam organization, they have a department which is about uh, the rail connections, the barge connections, the inland network. They have a department that is responsible for the inland network. And, and those are the people that indeed reach out and, 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 and look at the improvement, start the initiatives, look at what can we bring in there to improve. So automatically they connect also to the inland terminals. So that collaboration yeah, is something that, that is uh, part of the business of the Port Authority already. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I'm wondering if uh, we can take one more question live from one of our attendees. Uh, this is... Uh, I believe this person's name is uh, Mr. Satya from PTP. Um, 
can you, if you don't mind unmuting your mic and uh, if you can post, uh, ask your question. Uh, Mr. Satya. Okay, maybe what I'll do is, if we can't get them to come on live, uh, I'll ask their question on, your, on, on, on uh, Mr. Satya's behalf. Um, the question is, apart from excellent hardware, software, support systems, would uh, population size and business activity growth from FDIs and DDIs play an equally important role to promote growth in inland ports in Malaysia? So I would put this question to, um, I actually, I would open this question to all three of you. Um, uh, how did it work? Uh, uh, how would you answer this question? Um, uh, either Dr. Larissa or... Yeah. Uh, how would you answer this question? Would FDIs and DDIs play an important role? Or Mr. Remco, maybe we hear from both of you first before we can hear from MOT. Yeah, I, I could start with a short reply. Um, if you talk about business activity, population size, that is very much important once you talk about inland load center function of an inland port, because then you need a local cargo base for it to be viable. And then the, the inland container port serves as a hub for that region relatively close by. Without uh, a market there, there is no reason. If you talk about a um, rather transshipment hub, uh, the function of transshipment hub of the inland uh, container port, then uh, it is important that it is on the crossroads of the, of the corridors. And of course, a cargo base in the uh, region may help, but it's not the only function. So then it's more important to have the smooth transshipment facility and to be right there uh, located at the uh, crossing rail corridors or road corridors. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, would you like to add anything, Mr. Remco, to this? Yes, maybe, maybe some uh, remarks. Well, as shown in my presentation, uh, uh, the first reason uh, why the Netherlands uh, developed in the logistics hub for Europe is that what we are so much centrally located in, uh, in Europe and we have all the consumers around us, just like uh, Dr. Larissa just, uh, just explained. Um, and, and actually, it's the other way around, I, I would say. As, as long as when you are in this position and you have the market and you have the infrastructure to serve uh, the market, then you will attract uh, the, uh, the FDI. So it's not the other way around that you need the FDI uh, to, to in play order the to role. Do this, yeah. No, at first yes, you, you have to get the market sorted. and the infrastructure. Yeah, and, and, and then you will attract the FDI. So th that's the right uh, Cost. Uh, way Cost. to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Juan Anis, would you like to add anything? Uh, yeah, uh, in terms of that, I do agree with Dr. Larissa that I, I mean, de domestic demand is important also for an inland port to grow. So like I said before in Malaysia, we do, uh, I, uh, we do see the problem of competition between the inland port and the seaport, but we are addressing it because, as I said, there's need to have a symbiosis existent between these two, uh, these two ports. So yeah, we have that in our uh, national transport policy. Thank, so, thank so. you very much, Juan. Thank you very much. There's a question here for Mr. Remco again. Mr. Remco, but I, I think you answered this. I'm gonna put this out again because it's the questions come up again. And uh, just to clarify with us, was, was there any incentivizing or any kind of assistance or help in any manner that the Netherlands government had rendered upon uh, these companies, be it private or private government linked companies that uh, initiated and established this inland uh, ports that you have? Because you have like 40 over ports, right? So was there any sort of incentives or such given by the government or any kind of <clears throat> form of assistance? 
Um, well, as I explained, uh, the, the Dutch government uh, uh, stimulates uh, nine uh, top sectors uh, in the Netherlands, the top sector uh, policy. They do now for, for uh, I think, a little bit over six, seven, uh, seven years, which also means they make uh, budget available to promote uh, the, uh, the logistics uh, industry. Uh, they do so on a co-financing fa financing, uh, basis. So that means they expect also the business community to invest in, uh, in further improvements uh, as well. Uh, and they identify different uh, projects uh, to further improve the efficiency of the logistics uh, industry. And if you see the focus for the, the last couple of years, as I said, it's, it's mainly on innovation and, and in recent years, more and more on, uh, on sustainability. And they try to identify projects, uh, uh, well, to implement uh, the, the, the newest uh, technologies uh, in order to stay on, uh, on top. So it's mainly innovation, it's uh, digitization and automation, but also on uh, uh, collaboration. So really that is the future of logistics, is exchange of information and collaboration between uh, partners in the supply chain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, information. I believe we are getting close to the end of the session. I think we're probably about 17 minutes uh, ahead of time. Uh, before we end the session today, of course, um, we do still have a few questions that are still in the Q&A box, and these questions will be answered um, separately. Um, actually, there are only three questions here. One is, uh, there's a question on how many port authorities govern the ports, inlands and seaports in Netherlands? So is it a single port authority or do you have a number of port authorities? Maybe we'll take that quickly from both of you. We, we have many of, uh, of them. So all the seaports, they have their own port authority, but also here there's a lot of uh, cooperation and also the inland ports, they have their own port authorities. Okay, and the so you, yeah. yeah, so it's pretty similar to what we have, yeah? So there's a, a bunch of them. All right, yeah. thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for the, in, the insights that you have given us, um, the questions. There are still so many. I'm pretty sure there's still going to be more questions that I, uh, the Netherlands Embassy in Malaysia will have to uh, answer. And... Um, it's been, in fact, for me too, I, I, I myself as a moderator have learned uh, a lot in terms of how you've organized yourselves in Netherlands. And um, it's good to note that our ministry is here, Ministry of Transport is also here and has committed itself, committed our country to improving our inland ports as well. Uh, before we end the session uh, for today, we, we're going to have uh, the video again from... Um, uh, Holland uh, International Distribution Council on the, the one that we played earlier before the uh, speaker session started. This is Holland Knows the Way, so maybe we can have the video on now. All right, Reshma, we will do this. And, and before we, uh, we start the video, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, there's still nearly about 100 people with us at the moment. Thank you so much. Can, can we all please give a, a virtual round of applause for our speakers and our moderator? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, whether you logged in from the Netherlands, uh, from Malaysia, or of course uh, from elsewhere. Um, thank you so much, moderator and speaker. And it's now time for us to, to show the video and uh, wish you all a very pleasant day. And do get in contact, uh, please, with the Netherlands uh, Embassy who brought you this uh, webinar if you have any further questions about cooperation. Thank you so much to the Ministry of Transport for distributing uh, the event announcement and for getting so many people to uh, register for today. Ananis and your colleagues, thank you so much. All right, we will close uh, the session by showing the video again. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. We are Holland. With our 400 years of international trade experience, we know the way to excellent logistics, fast, and according to the latest quality standards. With our outstanding hinterland connections by road, river, short sea and rail, 
the accessibility of our world-class seaport and airport, we know the way to Europe and the world. 24-7, 365 days a year. With our flexible, multilingual labor force, we know the way to do business in Europe. With our smooth processes, we offer fast accessibility for your goods to distribute to and from the European market. We achieve continuous improvements in logistics. Our professional training, research, and educational institutions empower the rise of well-educated and trained people on a permanent base. Our knowledge, skills, and innovations are exported worldwide. We optimize the possibilities of the digital era. We are Holland. We have the expertise, network and knowledge to perfect your operations across all industries. Holland knows the way.